you say nothing, you stay away from nothing. In any direction, nothing is everything. These words come from today's guest, Rafael Rogowski, an internal medicine specialist with a subspecialty as a respiratory physician, and who, after practicing for 14 years, decided to stop everything and became an interpreter. Join me, Stefan Reinhardt, and my co-host, Jerry Sampson, as we talk about major life-changing decisions in this episode of The Author Couple. Jerry, Jerry, I mean, we're, we're continuing to, uh, to travel, right? We, last time we traveled in Colombia, and now we're traveling to Poland. Poland, yeah. Well, let's see, when was it, Stefan, that we did, uh, what, when did we lecture together there? Uh, uh, two years, 2019? 2019, yeah. yeah the, a... the Warsaw Orthodontic Congress. It um, actually, it's... Um, a tremendous uh, orthodontic meeting in Warsaw, um, sponsored by Ortho Van Kersey. and Stefan, you and I registered there two er, uh, lectured there two years ago. Yeah, that's it. And we had we the had best. a blast. The best, no, but oh, we oh, had oh, the food. The, the food. best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tartar. Beef tartar. Yeah. You wouldn't, you, you, wouldn't normally, you wouldn't normally think of Poland for exquisite food. Oi, this was... It's really the best I ever had. And it was not only the food, it was the whole experience that came with it. Yeah, yeah. I remember you had a bite of the tartare and you stopped. Well, that's for... Yeah, but the day before... Yeah. You were already there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you just sent me pictures of what you were, you were having for food. And I was at the airport eating some Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole experience was incredible. And part of the experience is when um, lecturing in Poland, this was a simultaneous translation as compared to consecutive. Well, the translator is a fella whose name is Rafael Regowski, a Polish fellow with uh, quite a Russian sounding name. Mm -hmm. And um, Stefan and I struck up a friendship with Rafael. And I knew from previous lectures, he's, he was a, uh, he's a remarkably interesting person. So we decided that we would do an odd cast with the odd fellows. And for the, the presentation that everyone's about to see, what stands out most memorably for you, Stefan? For me, and I think it was something that standed out uh, from when, when we were in Poland. It was my first time there. It, it's really how humble these people are, and it's, it's the same with Rafael Rogowski. He's, a, I mean, a brilliant person. You will see what he was, his life, what he was doing before, what he's doing now, the decisions he took, and every time, I mean, everything is so humble. So um, these these people, these dentists, orthodontists, they were so. Um, What's the word? I'm searching for the word. Um, like they really appreciate the fact that the, we were there taking some time to go there and lecture and you could feel they were, um, is that the word appreciative? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That's it. This is what I was feeling really that, the, you know, yeah, uh, something like I, I haven't seen before anywhere else yeah the, you've traveled a lot more than me have you seen is it a, a good feeling because it was not your first time there um, do you have this feeling with with um, poles with the, the, the that maybe you don't find somewhere else yeah they're um, they're quite hesitant to interact uh, with we have panel discussions and there, the the audience, which was substantial, there was a, a lot of people there for a meeting in Poland, 
and they're very hesitant to, uh, to interact. So needless to say, they found um, uh, Samson and Reinhardt uh, rather unique, especially when Stefan started dancing across the stage and kicked the table and some candy on the table on the stage went flying everywhere. Stefan, I started you were, the presentation like that. Yeah, you weren't the, the kicking the candy was not that uh, was not the plan. Was well, not planned. But your <laughs> your reaction, your reaction was interesting because it was like Fred Astaire. You decided to make the candy part of the routine as you kicked the candy off of the stage into the audience, and um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> nobody was injured. Nobody. Yeah. Right. Uh, the this translator uh, Rogovsky, when when I first met him, uh, I was quite impressed with how superb his command of the English language is. Um, actually, much better than mine. And in a conversation with him early on, and this is uh, I, I have lectured there, I believe six times. So in the first presentation. I said to him, well, besides doing the translation, he's considered the top translator in Poland, which I did not know at the time. He did not tell me that. Someone else did. Um, I said, what do you do besides translation for medical and dental meetings? And he said, well, this is actually what I do full time. And I said, well, did you, how did you get involved in this? And he said, well, I, I decided I was no longer uh, interested in practicing internal medicine. And I said, you're an internal medicine doctor. Yes. Well, um, that elevated my level of interest in who is this and why did he make that decision? He'll be talking about that during the presentation. And Stefan, I bet that you had the same impression that I did, that I wondered if he had an advanced degree in European history, didn't you? Oh, my God, yeah, I mean, this is this is what like, it was uh, like a history lesson. I, I, uh, you know, having this opportunity to meet people like that, to do these uh, odd casts um, and be able to learn at the same time. It was the same time, uh, same thing last time with, uh, with um, uh, one. I mean, we're learning, we're learning new things. I mean, isn't that, that's, that's, that's the whole point of this project. Yeah, well, it's the whole point of what you and I are both interested in. It's not, it's not, we're not just interested in teeth. No. Or uh, business finance with what, what I think you should bear in mind when you watch the three of us is that if I tell you about Raphael, I'm telling you about somebody else who had all these experiences during communism, during his childhood, uh, during the, the uh, change from, from communism to democracy and what that was like, uh, and telling you about somebody who made a life-changing decision and why they made that to no longer practice internal medicine. I'd be telling you about somebody, but now you're going to hear that somebody explain it themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, you'll also notice that his method of, of uh, conversation is quite matter of fact. The, the Polish people, um, until they get to know you quite well, they, they really don't show emotions the same way that Italians or mm -hmm. American, you know, Americans gush, you know, I mean, oh, God, it's just fantastic. This is the best. I, God. They go... And people from other cultures don't don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll notice that with Raphael, for example, Stefan, when I was there the first time, and I I was the only speaker on the program for two days. Oh. Well, during the breaks, and you know, I mean, you know, um, my personality and people watching the odd cast. I mean, I'm kind of a cross between uh, the court jester and the village idiot, and somebody with a brain. I mean, I'm a very approachable person. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm surprised I've gotten this far without uh, rehabilitation. So um, 
I, I noticed and I said to uh, Rogovsky, I said, people here during the breaks, they don't make eye contact. Mm. They, 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 um, like unless, they don't do that. They, they um, are much more reserved. And um, I think that you'll see with Rogovsky that you'll notice this, these reservations. And I asked him why that was. And he said, it's really a layover from communism and the KGB. <laughs> and I said to him, I don't understand. And he said, well, during communism, and remember, he experienced this in depth, that if you pass somebody on the street, if you were at a some sort of market with someone and you looked at them just a little too long, you didn't know if suddenly you're getting a tap on the shoulder or a knock on the door from the KGB. Mm -hmm. So, so without further ado, let's let's take a look. Look at me. Let's meet with Rafael Rogovsky. For people um, dialed into this episode, uh, this is Rafael Rogovsky. Is that a reasonable? pronunciation of your name yes you're doing very well <laughs> why don't you, you say it rogovsky rogovsky, Rogov, uh, rogovsky. Uh, st stress on the uh, on the second last syllable let's try it again rogovsky <laughs> <laughs> do it jerry and and he's not bragging about that either no no <laughs> um and <clears throat> but uh we met because you were uh, translating slash interpreting and an interesting uh, difference between the two uh, during my presentations in Poland. Actually, I think you've done all of them, but most of them, I think uh, you, uh, I, I heard of you before I actually met you. So uh, you must have been in Poland earlier. Uh, hmm. Well, one of the things that I was uh, shocked by and uh, immediately impressed is when I, I asked you, Raphael, well, besides uh, doing this translation, uh, what else do you do? And I found out that, in fact, you are a physician, a doctor of internal medicine. Isn't that correct? Yes. Uh, and uh, I also, for uh, reasons known only to uh, some part of myself that I can't mine too well for data, I also um, did re respiratory medicine as, as a subspecialty of internal medicine. I just, uh, uh, I, I fell in love with asthma as soon as I learned about it. So I, th I thought that I have to be a respiratory physician, uh, even though I worked um, at a department that was internal medicine, but with a nephrology slant. Uh, and uh, I thought it wasn't such a foolish idea because I was a mm, consultant for uh, the thoracic surgery department at that hospital. Uh, so uh, these people had issues with their lungs, obviously, amongst other things. Um, and um, I, I frequently had to qualify them or, or discuss with the surgeons whether um, it is feasible for the man or woman to live uh, after so and so many segments of their lungs are going to be excised. Uh, and and other such like things and also it, it was pretty nice to be an expert in something that my boss knew less about so that's uh, that's also a way to uh, to make your life easier <laughs> now how long did you practice medicine uh, for 14 years okay so here's the question that uh, I I've asked you before I'm sure Stefan was there when we were in Warsaw together uh, but I, I never tire of hearing your take on this. You you no longer practice medicine, isn't that right? No, it's been uh, 20 years since I saw my last patient. Okay. How did you? How and why did you make that decision? That's a that's a monumental decision. Uh, yes, it was, but it didn't come um, out of the blue sky, and it wasn't taken um, during a very short time. I had a phase in. Uh, first, I had to um, find out that uh, working at an internal medicine ward 
uh, is getting on top of me. I uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I had to find out why. I had to ask myself why. Um, and uh, due to the fact that I gave myself an honest answer, uh, I was able uh, to go to my boss's office and say, uh, I'm going to quit. Uh, I said that about six months before I did so, uh, before I did quit. And uh, he was dismayed because I was, uh, we were a group of uh, uh, kids that he raised, sort of. Uh, in during our uh, medical studies, we, we would go with him uh, every summer uh, to camp, which involved taking over an internal medicine ward uh, in an upcountry hospital. And we actually lived in that hospital for a month or so. Um, he was very brave in being the only qualified doctor with a bunch of students who had, um, you know, who were just learning. They didn't have a license to practice. Mm -hmm. And he took responsibility for everything we did. And I think um, we were so, um, we, we felt the burden of responsibility uh, that we, uh, we didn't mess up. I, I, I don't think there were ever any, any situations where we messed up. And we were so very much <coughs> liked by the local population. Uh, this was still the time when people were uh, hospitalized for elective uh, ends, like even a diagnostic workup. And um, the people living uh, in, in that little town would say, oh, I'll wait till the students come. Uh, and then, and then you, can, you can have me in, in at the ward. <coughs> and you can do whatever you like with me. Uh, so <laughs> that was uh, uh, that was something that uh, made us his kids. And he then uh, took and um, when he when he was manning a, a new ward, uh, he sort of handpicked the people uh, he he liked best, and I was one of them, which was obviously an honor. And then here's me coming uh, after some years and saying, "Okay, Dad." I'm gonna beat it. Um, that that was a bit difficult for me, but but still, I th thought I I had to do this, uh, otherwise I'd go crazy because the 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 crisis was so intense with me. Uh, I felt so uh, overwhelmed by uh, the patient's um, misfortunes, actually, which I could not um, set right. Um, it was obvious that people don't come to get cured if they come to an internal medicine department. Uh, this is uh, a medicine of chronic disease, um, very often uh, of bad prognosis. Uh, and uh, they would come trusting that they are here to get rid of the problem that brought them here. Uh, and I was the one that had to explain to them that uh, not necessarily that they have to learn to live with uh, mm -hmm. a disease. Um, uh, some of them, um, I saw people decide to die. They didn't have to do anything about it. They just decided to die and died. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those were things that really um, weighed me down. I started finding myself uh, a, a person who uh, loses professionalism because I don't want to find the worst scenario, worst case scenario in my patient, um, where I don't yet know what's wrong with them, and the differential includes some dire conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt that I want to steer away from the dire ones. Uh, in the end, of course, I, I didn't, but uh, it had to be done with some effort. Um, so mm, I thought, yeah, okay, uh, I have to stop doing this. And uh, I decided that I would move to a part-time outpatient uh, clinic job, which I did. And after three years of this part-time work, uh, which was actually in uh, lung diseases, in a lung diseases um, outpatient uh, clinic, um, I thought that uh, God, this patient is really difficult. It would have been bread and butter a few years ago. The guy is really difficult. 
I'm afraid of making mistakes that will not be set right later. Uh, and immediately after that, that very patient, you know, somebody wanted to get rid of him for at least a while because he was uh, a cardiac, uh, lung, gastrointestinal, you name it, uh, a patient for all of these specialties. Um, and also a feisty guy with lots of theories of his own. So he was difficult to talk into some modifications of treatment or lifestyle. And I thought, I'm not up to this. This is too difficult. There are too many pitfalls here. Uh, I would have coped with that three years ago, but I've lost my touch so quickly that this is the time to say stop. And I immediately called the nurses not to register new patients for me. And I handed in my notice uh, in the... Uh, well, with the management. So the, the bend point was actually one particular patient. Yes, yes, who just showed me how bad things can get yeah. if I continue down this road. And that was how long, how long ago was that? 20? That was uh, 2001. 20 okay, so 20 years ago. 20 years ago. It was and January, yeah, mm -hmm, I remember. The, the reason that, the, that this is quite fascinating is... Uh, uh, humans are creatures of habit. I mean, that, that takes a tremendous amount of courage, not just with this mentor, your father, as you, mm -hmm. your professional daddy, as I mm -hmm. call him, mm -hmm. but also to just decide that I'm done. That's it. I can't keep doing it. It's mm -hmm. quite remarkable. Yeah, I mean, and you were, as you said, you were, you're in your 60s now, so you were in your 40s. Not necessarily um, where. Yeah, not quite yet forty. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not necessarily where you decide that. Yeah, you stop something that could be. I mean, you know, when you're in medicine, all these things. Usually, they're your forties and your fifties are your big years. And but mm -hmm. have in those twenty years, has there been one day where you regretted your decision. Um. I don't think I ever regretted it because I knew why I made it. Uh, so I, uh, until today, I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, what I perhaps regretted was um, um, interesting things that I could have learned or done, um, patients I could have uh, met and possibly helped them in a way that nobody else could. Uh, so that was um, that was something that I thought. I missed out on, mm -hmm. but regret is not the word. But, um, but the, those things come, they come with all the rest. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that this is where Yes, this yes. And after some years, I had a, I had a thought that uh, it, it sort of crossed my mind that I have now gathered new experiences. I have worked um, on my own without any boss, uh, without any employer, only with clients. And I thought, yeah, I have a, a new view of my own person. So I'll probably, uh, I probably could consider going back because mm -hmm. now I would be safer, emotionally yeah. safer. Yeah. Um, and uh, it took me, uh, I don't know how this happens, you know, we, I, I would frequently visit my, my colleagues uh, in the hospital, uh, you know, the people I used to work with because we were a great team. Mm -hmm. We liked each other. And um, uh, so, so just dropping in and saying hello uh, was something normal. Uh, and having thought this, pretty soon I saw a, a situation on the hospital corridor where there was a guy of, say, 60-something wheeled on a bed um, with uh, a drip hanging above him, uh, some other... Uh, stuff stuck into him and uh, a catheter with a bag collecting urine and so on and um, nothing nothing unusual for a hospital mm -hmm. um, what was um, remarkable for me was that this man was crying and the two nurses that were wheeling him um, was staring into infinity somewhere above his head, completely ignoring him. And uh, 
I thought, yeah, this is exactly what I ran from because I can't stare into infinity yeah. when I see people like that. So I, I realized if I get back to it, I will be ensnared exactly the same way as I was before. Yeah. So no coming back for me. Mm -hmm. um, how <laughs> now, uh, as I said, I, I was just uh, surprised and obviously impressed that you're a physician, but you're full time translator. How did that happen? Um, that happened pretty early on. And that was a funny thing that would not have happened, say, in America or um, in those days, a capitalist country where um, doctors were high earners uh, or are high earners. Um, in Poland, uh, being a doctor uh, was um, an opportunity to earn as a private practice uh, owner, uh, but that came later after you'd served your uh, years of slavery, uh, and also um, it in it the two things went together because the system uh, was so badly constructed that it was full of. Um, let's say irregularities mm -hmm. um, not to say corruption because corruption was also there uh, but irregularities where mm, uh, the cost of the system was actually unknown nobody even the payers didn't know how much it cost uh, and uh, therefore efficiency was certainly not something that was required and it wasn't even possible I mean if if uh, a doctor trained in an efficiency driven system came to work there they would probably have a nervous breakdown within a week or two because nothing functioned efficiently mm. even in my times when uh, that was the time of the transition I started working uh, at the mm, end of uh, the communist rule and mm, then I sort of witnessed and participated in the changes that went uh, together with uh, with the economic transition uh, with the new system new political system uh, and uh, I had a feeling that I would have been able to run half of the ward single-handed if all I needed to do was actually clinical medicine mm. like um, seeing the patients examining them talking to them uh, and making decisions and telling somebody to put those decisions into effect. This guy needs uh, ex test so and so, the other guy has to get this and this treatment and, and so on and so forth. Um, while the reality of the story was that uh, I had to um, phone or better still walk to the given labs talk to people, make sure they liked me. That, that was part of being an efficient <laughs> physician. Uh, you, people had to like you. So if they liked you, they would tend to your patients uh, better than to somebody's patients they didn't like. And uh, some of that was also getting good um, slots, time slots uh, for scheduled exams. Uh, in that case, I would not have to wait for a barium enema for two weeks three days maybe would be cool uh, not always achievable but one week would be quite good I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like <laughs> to avoid waiting for a barium enema at all actually <laughs> no, yeah um, so so you would you, you would ask me to to slow things down i <laughs> know <laughs> yeah yeah or that would be things, fun speed things up the and so, so, so the you know, uh, I started working, and my first um, salary was lower than the salary of um, an experienced nurse, and uh, it was also lower than uh, an allowance I received after my father's death. Uh, it was uh, a sort of you know social uh, aid payment that I had to finish my studies due to the fact that my father uh, had died while I was still a student. Um, this was related to the um, 
level of his earnings so and of course it wasn't 100 percent of his earnings it was a, a, a percentage i don't even know what percentage uh, but it was relatively cool i didn't have to worry uh, about making it uh, from one month to the other um, during my studies i didn't have to uh, get odd jobs or things like that uh, and here i come i want to start working i want to take the next step and i find out that suddenly my income, I of course lose this um, social security payment um, because now I, I have my diploma and I'm starting to, uh, to earn money and it turns out that that uh, payslip has a lower sum than that social security uh, payment that I had. So, uh, so as not to um, ask anyone for, for financial help, I had to look for some odd job or additional job that would um, fill, fill in the gap mm -hmm. uh, and of course it couldn't be in medicine because I was um, I was an intern right mm -hmm. so uh, nobody would would hire me I couldn't open my own practice uh, I didn't yet have a full license um, and uh, I talked to a friend uh, who had already done the same thing he was an engineer and uh, he became an interpreter for the same reason. I mean, actually, no, he, he didn't have a, <laughs> a social security su support payment, uh, but uh, he also thought that the jobs offered to him in Poland as an engineer were not well remunerated, and uh, being an interpreter, or rather, in those days, less an interpreter, more a translator, um, was paid off much better. And I went to one of the agencies. Uh, I said... Um, to the one that didn't require me to present a, uh, a linguistic diploma because th there were two uh, in, tho in those days in a big city like Warsaw and uh, one of them required you to present a diploma, the other did not. So I went to the one that didn't mm -hmm. and that's how it started. The, um, how, how, do, how would you characterize the difference between a translator and an interpreter? Translation is... Uh, something you do with written language that is uh, conveying something that you have in writing in another language but also in writing mm -hmm. while interpreting is uh, translating spoken language mm -hmm. one language into the other but the input is spoken and the output is spoken the uh, i do want to uh, mention before it escapes my uh, <coughs> frontal or occipital lobe or even the parietal could be involved, I'm not sure. But there isn't, there's an honorary society that recognizes uh, excellence in your craft. What, what is the name of that? Uh, it, the, the name is AIC, uh, which is A-I-C-C, Association Internationale des Interprètes de Conférence. Et voilà. <laughs> So, uh, International Association of Conference Interpreters. And this is uh, quite a uh, substantially, well, it's difficult to get in. You have to be quite superior, isn't that? Uh, well, at least your peers have to um, yes. see you as such because it is uh, completely based on, on peer review or peer assessment. You, you have to have an adequate number of uh, colleagues who are, ready to vouch for you in writing, saying that you are good in this language combination, for example. And there is a mm, very uh, well-defined scheme as to what language combination has to be presented by those referees. Uh, so if they are to say that your English is good when you use English interpreting from Polish, they have to have a combination with Polish and with English, and uh, their English, uh, at least um, one of them has to have English A, A meaning um, equivalent to mother tongue, B is foreign active, and C is foreign passive. Uh, passive meaning you, you can translate from, but not into. Mm. Even though... Um, you possibly could uh, do the interpretation both both ways, say 
between French and English. Um, my, my combination that I have registered is Polish mm. and English both ways, where okay. Polish is my mother tongue, English is my active foreign language. Um, but if I wanted uh, to register one of the languages that I also know, uh, but I would never dare to interpret into, um, like German, uh, I would say uh, German could be my C. How long ago were you inducted into this society? Not very long ago. That was 2016, actually. I did that, um, um, well, a little out of self-interest uh, because uh, it uh, does give you uh, a certain, well, a better standing in the industry uh, among colleagues. Uh, and also I thought that, um, well, I've been doing this for long enough and I have uh, received some, some positive assessments from colleagues I look up to. Uh, and I thought, well, it's high time to, to try and uh, go through the red tape that is required. So you apply to be part of the society? Yes, you apply, and uh, twice a year the society uh, has a special body uh, that uh, assesses these applications. Uh, twice a year the, that special body meets and assesses all the applications that have a deadline for, for the given sitting or session, and, uh, and they, mm, you know, either, either they accept you or they turn you down and say, well, you have to wait a little longer. It, it can also be challenged. I mean, uh, the, uh, the process is public, uh, so other members, if they have something against you, they can challenge you. Okay. The, um, uh, Stefan, do you have any... Uh, I've got something else that I think is uh, quite interesting for everyone. Stefan, did you have any... Well, I was wondering where, where, because now we know how you started, but the, where did you learn your English? Obviously, and you have, like, you have a British accent. Yeah. Like, and yes, it was a, it was a British school mm -hmm. in okay. uh, in Kenya in Nairobi. Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, um, when I was a child. I I went there with my parents. My father was a WHO medical officer. Um, who was uh, sent to East Africa to uh, do uh, stuff that I think uh, until today must have been very exciting because uh, it, it was um, applied epidemiology. Um, he, he was also a, a clinical physician in, uh, in Poland before uh, that. And then uh, when he applied to, to work for the WHO, he had to go through uh, courses in this um, applied brand of epidemiology where you would actually go into the field and uh, try to ascertain where certain infectious diseases came from, how they, uh, how they fueled an outbreak, for example, or something like that. Um, that involved um, traveling into uh, really remote areas sometimes setting up field hospitals there and um, doing all kinds of things that uh, I think must have made him feel that he's making a difference, that uh, mm -hmm. something is actually happening. So uh, you were for the people. part of this as a child? Yeah, of course I didn't travel with my father because that wouldn't be, uh, th that would have been probably m very counterproductive. I mean, risky for me and distracting for, for my father as uh, so he had a job to do. Uh, but yeah, he would, um, you know, get on a little plane uh, as a passenger rather than a, than a uh, pilot. Mm. Yeah, and uh, he would be flown into little airfields, airstrips somewhere uh, up country. And um, I, I have in my uh, archive uh, some slides, celluloid slides because that was the thing in my house. I mean, uh, we, we did not accept prints. Um, celluloid slides were, th were the only acceptable form of photography. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that is what we, uh, what we had. I, I have some uh, photos. S somebody mm, 
took them from a distance so as to not to interrupt the interaction. Uh, my father came up to uh, two uh, ladies of the Turkana tribe, uh, tall, slender women, uh, made even taller by the fact that they had uh, some high calabashes on their heads that they were carrying from point A to point B, probably containing water or something. And um, uh, there is take one where they are, he is talking, I, I think, with an interpreter actually, uh, because he didn't speak Turkana and they didn't speak English for sure. And they didn't even, s even speak Swahili, I don't think, because Swahili is the lingua franca of East Africa. Um, but many, uh, many uh, remote tribes don't uh, have a good command of Swahili. Uh, so, uh, so the interpreter was explaining what my father wanted of them. Uh, he wanted to take anal smears uh, because uh, that was uh, that was the tracking of a cholera outbreak. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, fir the first, the yeah, the first um, picture shows everybody uh, full of composure, you know, respect, etc. And the next shows uh, their reaction to the explanation that the interpreter gave them. What this white guy wants of them? Uh, they were laughing, almost losing the calabashes on their heads, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so they thought it was humorous. They didn't. They didn't yes. Make yeah. No. No. They didn't feel offended. They just thought it was. Uh, I mean, how crazy can you be, right? <laughs> yeah, I can, Travel right, half the world to smear asses, right? <laughs> I can. I can see one of the women saying to the other, "Did you just hear what this guy?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what were? Uh, am I correct that the change from? Uh, being uh, ruled by Russia, uh, I think it was October 27th of 1991, wasn't it? Isn't that, is um, that a bit Not really. It was earlier. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe you you mean uh, the falling of the Berlin Wall? That was well, 1990. I think they, I, I, when was the vote where there was this shock they went through Poland? The vote, uh, the vote was in 1989 on the 4th of June, actually. Um, Poland was the first uh, country among the Soviet bloc countries um, uh, that had um, sort of come to a, a negotiated solution to the to the problem. I mean, uh, it was obvious that uh, the system was bankrupt. It was bankrupt uh, not only in terms in monetary terms, but also in political terms. Um, the then ruling uh, communists, um, especially the younger ones, understood that their power, based on a political and ideological foundation um, safeguarded by Russia, uh, was just about to sputter out, to, to end. Uh, so, uh, if they wanted to stay in power or at least um, remain powerful, and safe, uh, they had to organize a new base for that power, and the obvious answer was to make it economic. Mm -hmm. uh, so the mm, the downfall of the economy uh, required a very serious overhaul, a very difficult set of reforms, which obviously would have caused um, popular or, or mm, what, is, what would you call it, um, well, unrest, general unrest in the, in the population. Revolution? Is that revolution? Not, not exactly, no. I don't think they feared revolution, but they mm -hmm. feared a situation where uh, things will get out of hand and there will be a, a long, uh, drawn-out uh, conflict with people in the streets and things like that. So this, uh, is 1980, this is 1989. This is 1989, yes. And in, in, the s in the spring of 1989, or late, uh, late winter, um, I remember hiking in, in the mountains in wet snow in March when these negotiations were going on, the round table, something that um, 
was a founding myth of uh, of the Third Republic. Uh, I mean, the uh, the Poland that emerged after after these elections, mm -hmm. the non-communist <coughs> Poland. Uh, the, 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 the Round Table was uh, w was uh, actually constructed. It, it's a physical piece of furniture. Uh, that w that people sat around and uh, and set up uh, the new concept of running the country. Uh, first of all, running an election. Uh, elections were staged before, but they were obviously um, just make believe that that was not uh, a, a free decision of the of the nation. Uh, the results were uh, known before. Uh, the election was actually staged, plus there was no alternative. I mean, everybody who uh, was a candidate uh, had to be earmarked by the party. So mm -hmm. there was no point, actually, even in, in uh, trying to find out who these people were, because uh, they would not uh, do anything of their own accord. Uh, and the election was... Um something that led to a contract parliament. That's what it's called. Um, the contract parliament was um, supposed to be uh, manned by um, in two-thirds. Uh, there was a guarantee for, for the ruling party to uh, put in MPs and one-third uh, was solidarity or, or the opposition in general, which was basically the solidarity trade union and its uh, the political uh, structures. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, uh, the balance for this unfair setup of the parliament was uh, introducing uh, the, the upper house, the Senate, making the hitherto parliament the lower house and introducing the senate uh, which was uh, where the election was completely free no uh, no guarantees for the communists to uh, to take uh, seats and uh, it was interesting that out of the hundred seats available in the senate uh, the election um, gave a landslide victory to solidarity 99 to 1 uh, and even that one uh, was uh, not a representative of the Communist Party. Uh, he was just uh, a mafia-type businessman who just who just needed to be in the Senate, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, so he uh, organized um, a very uh, generous parties for his electorate, and he and he won. Well, he deserved it, didn't he? I mean, he spent so much money on it that he had to win. And, uh, well, 99 to 1 was a good result anyway, while in the, uh, in the uh, lower house of the parliament, the two-thirds um, were actually uh, to be uh, populated by the, by the communist MPs, but it was interesting. I, was, uh, mm, I had uh, volunteered for the uh, election committee uh, in my uh, municipality, uh, and uh, it was a tremendous experience uh, seeing how the uh, uh, all the um, lists of the communist candidates were completely crossed out, each and every one of them, um, while the uh, ones that were free uh, to be uh, to be voted upon, where of course the communists also had their candidates. Uh, there the selection invariably pointed to the uh, solidarity uh, representative and uh, i remember uh, a communist who was uh, uh, allowed in like uh, a representative of any of the involved parties or caucuses uh, not caucuses uh, or factions um as a sort of uh, you know a, a an oversight exercised by people. So, so this communist, I, I knew this guy, he was a teacher. Uh, he was sitting there as we were counting the votes and he was checking uh, whether we're counting well. And when he saw uh, that about a hundred 
crossed out uh, names of communist candidates, he just stood up and walked out. Mm. Uh, he, he, did, he didn't want to look at this anymore, didn't want to watch, didn't want to witness the situation. Um, and um, obviously uh, the lower house of parliament was the source of the government. Uh, I mean the party that had the majority there had to set up the government, so the communists set up the government. And uh, uh, they started to uh, introduce changes in the economy that were ultra-liberal, or neoliberal, you would mm -hmm. say. Uh, first of all, they liberated prices, um, something completely unknown in a communist system. Uh, and if you have a shortage of practically everything, what can happen to the prices? There's much more money in the system than there is uh, goods to buy for that money. So uh, the first year of that uh, was when uh, the inflation was, I don't know, 700 percent or something like that. Um, it was very difficult to keep up uh, with the prices. And um, th pretty soon, th it was a matter of months, when that uh, government headed by, by the communists gave up and uh, the first non-communist government was established. That was the uh, early autumn, maybe September it was, uh, of 1989. So. It was the first uh, non-communist government in the region. Mm. But uh, uh, I always say it's like in the, in the old times when computers were not yet uh, widely available, the person that had the first computer in the neighborhood pretty soon found themselves owning the worst computer in the neighborhood because everybody who bought a computer later had a better one. And we were in a similar situation <laughs> because the countries that were just a little slower than Poland in uh, organizing their liberation of the communist rule um, could avoid certain uh, mistakes that uh, Poland had made. And uh, for Poland, it was not necessarily a question of mistakes, but a question of uh, the balance of power. Mm -hmm. The communists were still too strong to actually surrender as much as they surrendered in other countries later, where they saw there was really almost nothing to save. Uh, so uh, all they could do was save their own asses and, uh, and give the opposition whatever they wanted. Now but how didn't how that, 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 what happened in Poland, did that bring the fall of the Berlin Wall? Because uh, it, it was what started it, because yeah. um, uh, the actual fall of the Berlin Wall was uh, something that the Germans did themselves. Uh, but, um, th and that was, uh, it's, a, it's a funny story because it happened due to the fact that uh, a deputy minister of the interior staged a press conference where he uh, got a question that he didn't really know the answer to um, and the way he answered it made the Berlin Wall topple. Uh, he said that um, we are on the way to um, lifting the, the barriers to traveling across the German-German border uh, and uh, the journalist wanted to know since when uh, is this coming into force? When is the date uh, when this new order starts? And he says, I don't know, probably today as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and, and that was it. <laughs> yeah, seriously, that was it. Yeah, really? that was it. Yeah, we, you know, b people just stormed the wall, right? And the, the soldiers that would have just a day earlier shot to kill uh, just, uh, you know, uh -huh. didn't do anything. They stood by. How old and how old were you? Uh, if for example, what I, what I'm curious about it, were your specific feelings when all of these changes started happening in in Poland. Um, more so, well, that's my specific question: is how you were feeling about this, and how and how old were you at that time? Uh, when uh, things started in 1980, which was nine years earlier. Uh, I was uh, just out of high school, uh, so just before uh, taking up studies, and uh, 
well, the feeling I had back then was um, initi initially I thought, okay, we're going to have a rerun of 1970 where there were strikes. Um, the workers went out into the streets, tanks were rolled out, and people were shot. Mm -hmm. um, in 1976, there were strikes where um, the killing was not as outrageous, uh, but uh, there were many, uh, you know, completely uh, lawless uh, actions by the police mm -hmm. uh, with beatings, uh, tortures, and things like that. Uh, before that, uh, there was 1968 where the students rioted um, and that led to nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, earlier still, 1956, which um, I think, um, I am not entirely sure and I wouldn't want any Hungarians listening to this uh, feel offended, uh, but I think w the uh, riots in 1956 in, in Poznań were something that um, made the Hungarians feel that they uh, that it's time for their uprising. And they had a true uprising, a true insurgency, which was um, um, you know, raised by, uh, by Russian tanks that actually went through the border uh, and invaded practically invaded Hungary. That was 1956. Uh, killing very many uh, people. Uh, so uh, I had a feeling in 1980 that we're, we're going to have the same scenario again. Um, there's th also the Prague Spring of uh, 1968, uh, I think, which, uh, which ended up in the Russians weren't so stupid this time. Uh, they made every signatory of the Warsaw Pact send in their troops to, to, the, to Czechoslovakia uh, when, uh, when the communists... Uh, actually, the Communist Party wanted reforms there mm. uh, and uh, they, they wanted to go you know, towards democracy. Uh, they called it uh, socialism with a human face, which says a lot. Uh, what face did it have before? <laughs> um, uh, and um, mm, this ended up also in uh, in a bloody intervention. Um, fortunately, not as bad as 1956 in Hungary, but still, and uh, everybody was guilty. I mean, uh, the whole Warsaw Pact, all the countries, all the armies, were guilty of uh, the intervention. Uh, so uh, the Russians uh, sort of were lost in the crowd. Uh, nobody could now point to the Russians as being the only perpetrator. Uh, so go going back to the ni 1980, I, I thought was was going to be the start of the same sad story, of the same tragedy. Uh, uh, but this time the um, uh, the workers seemed to be uh, better prepared in terms of strategy. They didn't go out into the street. They occupied the shipyards and uh, they stayed in. They, they made it a point to keep uh, the shipyards under lock and key. Nobody went in, nobody went out. Uh, so it was difficult to infiltrate and there was uh, no pretext to open fire. And they also had uh, intellectuals um, advising them, mm -hmm. and those were people who already had uh, a good track record of uh, dissident work, uh, where in 1976, after 1976 strikes, they set up the Committee of um, for the Defense of the Workers, uh, where they would um, offer pro bono uh, legal uh, assistance to to them uh, both in court cases and in all other situations they would need it you know the 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 workers who were actually caught uh, because or, or apprehended arrested because uh, because they uh, protested in the streets 
Uh, so uh, they were th they were the group that uh, largely later formed the political elite of uh, of the new Poland after 1989, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the strike leader Lech Wałęsa, who was a shipyard worker, an electrician, um, uh, who later became president, uh, was not necessarily the 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 best guy to uh, to lead a country in that position. Uh, he was more uh, uh, a popular tribune, like uh, you know, somebody who, uh, based on the ancient Roman tradition, uh, would represent the people, would represent you, the you proletariat. Speaking. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, what did you say? He was good at public speaking. Yes, he was good at public speaking, even though his Polish was terrible, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, the simplicity of his um, um, of his words of his sentences was uh, actually Im imp impenetrable. Initially, he uh, he would speak in such a way that anything could be construed out of what he said, mm -hmm. depending on uh, how the uh, listener felt. Uh, later he he made tremendous progress he became a very good speaker and i had the uh, uh honor i can say and pleasure of translating him several times okay. and and the first time i did that uh, at an economic forum i thought oh What's no i'm name? dead i i will not uh, i will not tackle that because uh, he was known for his interviews where i rarely understood what he meant uh, what he meant to say. So putting this into uh, another language would be a disaster. But do you think, Rafael, that um, um, because he started this, this, this thing in 1980? Yes. Around that? Yes, so but, he, wa that but he, was also, that he was also part of the 1970 strikes. He okay. wasn't a leader back then, but he was okay. also uh, in the 1970 strikes. So, so do you think that the government probably, because of uh, what you said, didn't really take him seriously? And just said, you know, wow, um, let, let him do his thing anyway. And well, uh, at the initial stage, possibly, yeah, because they they uh, they probably thought that um, he w he's been made by somebody else. Uh, okay. He is not of his own making. Okay, he's a puppet set up there, yeah, I, told to I say wrong? things. Am I wrong? This is like Lewenza. Yeah, that's who Lech you're Lewenza, Yes, yes, yes uh -huh. that that that's the guy we're talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> Just as a is a quick drop in the bucket, I um, a guy I knew quite well. I'm not sure if he's still alive, but uh, he was very involved in U.S. the U.S. labor movement. Uh, mm -hmm. He was not a small figure, and um, he did he met Lech Luenza in, in Poland in Warsaw mm -hmm. when Luenza was being honored, and I said to. Uh, I said to this friend of mine, whose name I'm not going to mention, uh, <clears throat> for good reasons, um, I said, what was your impression of him? And uh, this friend of mine looked at me and he said, that guy has a huge set of testicles. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy who made the statement. Yeah. Had, been, had some big balls himself. <laughs> he was packing a set, baby. I mean, this is, we're talking about... <laughs> It, it, that made a huge impression on me that this really, really influential, tough uh -huh. guy said that about Lech Luenza. I mean, uh -huh. it was like, mm -hmm. don't play with that guy. Um, I just wanted to, I didn't. Yeah, I had... I, and I, I am of the same opinion because uh, later when, uh, when martial law was introduced to clamp down on the solidarity movement, uh, he was uh, interned, taken away uh, it, to the middle of nowhere, to a place where... First of all, nobody knew where he was. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not know where that was. All he saw around him was forest, uh, deep forest. Um, he could only guess where that is. And they, uh, they tried to break him uh, you know, with innuendos, with uh, the making him feel that he is alone. He had, of course, no news feed. So he didn't know what was happening. So they would tell him, you know, uh, it's all back in our hands. Uh, solidarity is done. Uh, your family is uh, in our hands. So just remember that. And, you know, all that stuff. 
and he didn't sign anything, he didn't announce anything, he didn't go along with them at all, uh, which was, um, you know, that, that was balls, uh, because he, uh, everybody went through this for the first time in their lives. Uh, as people say, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and there are many younger than him saying that, yeah, he was a collaborator, he is, uh, you know, he, he's just an idiot, uh, he's a traitor, even that, as far as that uh, going. He was, uh, he was under severe pressure in the 1970s coming from uh, the secret police, and uh, he did sign papers stating that he will collaborate, but it's a difference whether he signed the papers saying that he will collaborate, and when if he collaborated. He didn't actually collaborate. Uh, who was to know when the whole thing is to topple? He had a family. I mean, people who uh, say bad things about him, and the current government in Poland does that because they want their own uh, founding myth, mm -hmm. and Valencia is not part of that, so there's no place for him in that. Uh, when they came to power in 2015, one of their first big campaigns was to uh, completely denigrate Valenza. Okay. To uh, make everybody aware that he was just a puppet of the secret uh, police. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole thing was made, uh, was, was a make-believe. Uh, sure. That, uh, yes, there was true solidarity, but uh, he was there to, to keep right. it under control. He was there to do the things that uh, the communists wanted him to do. This is an important thing uh, when there's a, a takeover is to destroy the sustaining mythology yeah. of the yes. previous culture. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, I'm not afraid to say that that's uh, in large part, I see that's what's going on r right here in the USA mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. to destroy the sustaining mythology of what, the USA has been based on for centuries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so was, was there uh, maybe a funny question or a bit because I don't know about how uh, religious uh, Polish people are, but was there any influence uh, of having a Polish Pope at the time in the 80s? Yes, I think uh, the influence was very important okay. because the Poles uh, uh, were very re religious back then. They yeah. still are quite religious now, although much less so. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the 70s, or uh, during communist rule, the church had a tremendous role to play uh, in, um, in keeping um, people uh, together in uh, a sense of uh, community and hope uh, at the same time. Uh, and so that's uh, quite positive. Sorry? You would say that's quite positive on the part of the church. Yes. Back then, they had a very positive role to play, and uh, I think they did. Um, they, uh, they, were on a ve they, they kept a very difficult balance uh, so as not to be erased, wiped out. The communists understood that it was not in their interest uh, because uh, the population of the country would not accept the same change uh, that was uh, that happened in Russia for example where mm, uh, churches were were changed into uh, warehouses um, this did not happen in Poland and um, I think it saved the communists a lot of headache that it didn't um, so they uh, they exerted big pressure on uh, on the hierarchy of the church uh, but there were some uh, quite quite clever uh, strategists and tacticians among them and they managed somehow to uh, keep their head above the water and uh, the later Pope uh, uh, John Paul II uh, was one of these people and it was very it was a big surprise that he was elected um, so uh, and another big surprise that the communists actually allowed him to visit Poland um, 
that was also a, a sort of fine balance that they wanted to find because uh, every Pole knew that we had a Polish Pope, right? So the Poles had a sort of ownership, a feeling of ownership of this guy. And uh, I read that uh, many people in Rome uh, were mm, well resented that. I mean, m many of the of the Roman hierarchy resented that that because they said, yeah, because he seems to be a Pope of Poland and uh, somewhere in in uh, in the background he is also a Pope of the world, but uh, <coughs> but he's chiefly a Pope of Poland. Um, he and he had quite a lot to do there, uh, which I think uh, was successful, mm. because uh, th there was probably a, a lot of diplomacy, you know, behind the scenes activity, etc. Et uh, but certain things that he he'd said to the crowds um, in Poland stuck with them and uh, sort of changed uh, the mindset and made it. Um, obvious that the change is coming, that uh, since uh, things went as far as having a pole being a pope, uh, it can't just end there. Things yeah. have to change further. And so that's yeah. uh, actually what did happen. Yeah, I think the uh, part, of <coughs> part of what I'm hearing that, that I've experienced in other cultures is that people without hope um, can revolt at a certain point. For example, um, in my uh, in my orthodontic training at Northwestern uh, from 1979 uh, to 1981 in Chicago, the first um, Chinese student in a generation was allowed to come to study orthodontics at Northwestern. His name, uh, he's passed away now, his name was Fu Min Kui. And, um, that was the main reason I was invited numerous times. He was the main reason to start with to speak in China. And I asked him um, about China and about the the fact that China had come into the World Bank and out from behind uh, Mao communism. And it was it's quite interesting to me, Raphael, that he's basically was expressing the same thing. So uh, Fu was alive through all of these different changes. And he said, well, essentially what you've had in China are the people and the party. Mm -hmm. there, there's, it's not a bell-shaped curve. Mm -hmm. It's the people and the party. And then different yes. levels of the party. Yes. But now I said, for how long do you think the Chinese economy, uh, and again, keep, about, keep in mind this, when this was, this would have been in 1980. Uh, yeah, way way before globalization and inviting China into into the global system, right? Yes. And I said, how long do you think the Chinese economy, this is after I was in China with him, I said, how long do you think the Chinese economy will continue to grow at the pace it's growing? And he said, well, now people have hope. And mm -hmm. uh, it's the emergence of the middle class, which we have not had as long as he'd been alive, essentially. Mm -hmm. So... It's it's interesting to me that you're uh, saying that a lot of the same things were happening, and I had no idea um, to the depth that that the Pope had being Polish that, that what that stimulated in people's minds. It was it certainly was, um, and uh, when when he died, uh, well, people were. Uh, broken and also didn't know how to cope with the situation that the guy in Rome is not our guy, right? Is not Polish. Uh, that was, uh, y y you can think it's a little funny, um, but, uh, uh, you know, for, for somebody who is, say, 80, um, the, the rule of one pope uh, may seem a short time for me, I was in high school when he was elected, uh, so when he died, that was like half my life or even more. <laughs> right? So, so I had a different perspective. Um, I could barely remember Pope John, John Paul the First and and Paul the Sixth, uh, who were who were his predecessors. Uh, J.P. One was the, was the guy who who was a pope for I don't know, 
ninety long. days, ninety days maybe or something yeah, like that's that. It. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was he. He was young and seemed healthy, and suddenly he died, um, which of course raised many conspiracy theories. But uh, that's another story. Um, but but yeah, he was uh, he was elected, and uh, that was most of my life. So so y you may sort of feel that uh, this is the way things are, right? And then they're suddenly not the way uh, uh, that you're used to, and it takes some getting used to. Well, it, it's my father-in-law used to say uh, that the term, if the current trend continues, uh, was ridiculous. The <laughs> current trend never continues. Never. Or trend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, this is quite, uh, so, like Lavenza in the in this situation, um, I detect that that had quite an effect on you personally, Raphael, and emotionally. The the amount of courage uh, and um, uh, self assurance that that he was showing in the face of all of this adversity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. seems like it had it had quite an effect on you personally. Is that a fair statement? Well, uh, yes, you could say that. You, you could say that. Um, you know, it's something that uh, I don't think I uh, I recognized him as that person uh, or as that influencer uh, at the at that stage. What I thought was um, uh, even possibly shame that I had been living a relatively comfortable life uh, in the system mm. uh, and. Uh, here we go, people are desperate enough to put, put uh, so much at stake uh, because uh, it takes not only courage, you also have to feel desperate, all things considered, because you can be courageous but you'll say, okay, this is uh, something that will hurt my family or uh, I may get killed in the process or something like that. So uh, reason will argue against it. Uh, but if you're desperate, you will put all these things aside. Yeah, I. Uh, this may come as a, not a shock to either of you, but those are things that I'm quite fascinated by. Is uh, um, under what conditions, when it's not a a, a a moment of passion? Because people that I've talked to, for example, that are war heroes, World War II heroes, they're they always say the same thing: that was not planned. Mm -hmm. It just, it happened. I didn't think about it. I just did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, these people were highly decorated. Now, it's it's a different situation, isn't it? When you actually, as you're saying, Raphael, you have time to think about the consequences of your actions. Mm -hmm. Part of which is is that if if you, the royal you, the the person we're talking about, like Lavenza, uh, for example, would be good uh, a good one in this context. If I don't do this and take these incredible risks for myself and my family and uh, my culture, if I don't, I won't be able to live with myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I have to. That they, it's, it, it, it's a matter of self-preservation in a way, don't you think? Or do you think that's an overstatement? Uh, I think uh, these things um, vary, they fluctuate even uh, during the things that happen, um, during the events, and I think uh, it's different for every uh, single participant uh, of those events. Uh, and I think every participant would tell a different story, um, or maybe with hindsight they would tell the same story, but I'm not sure that they felt exactly the same when it happened. Um, uh, I remember student strikes in uh, 1981, it was, um, which I also participated in, and um, there was, um, for me, there was a feeling that, uh, for one thing, I had to be there and participate. On the other hand, I didn't want to be part of the new political setup. I I looked at my colleagues who who had that political drive in them, and they had to mm, steer the mass that was there in the building. Uh, 
control them. Uh, they could panic, they could um, get themselves killed, or they, can, they could do anything depending on how the authorities would handle that strike. Because uh, there, was, there was a period when all the universities in Poland were on strike. This was all rela related to certain happenings uh, during the so-called so Solidarity Carnival. Uh, following uh, the signing of the agreements uh, at the uh, 31st of uh, August 1980 um, and then a year and three months later on the 13th of December martial law was introduced. Um, during that time most of that year 1981 was the year my father died but he died in November a sudden death uh, so he was uh, fully active uh, in the hospital where he worked and he told me several times that there were orders to clear out beds uh, to prepare for mass casualties um, on several occasions. Nothing happened, but it seemed that the, uh, the party, the communists, were ready to clamp down several times. Um, and there was a, a very strained touch-and-go year, uh, year and three months, uh, where uh, Solidarity tried to sort of enforce what was signed at the end of September of 1980, because there were certain concessions made by the, by the communists, uh, but there were also um, difficulties made to thwart the actual implementation. So these difficulties would uh, cause uh, protest strikes, solidarity strikes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the universities also wanted more autonomy and some uh, sway on the... For example, there was, uh, there was the issue of Marxist philosophy being taught in, uh, in the universities. And um, there was a requirement uh, made by the students, we want philosophy not mm -hmm. Marxist philosophy. Teach us philosophy. Mm -hmm. We're fine with that. Marx is part of that. You can teach us Marxist philosophy as part of the curriculum, but we want philosophy. And, you know, th that was just one example. Uh, and I actually did have philosophy classes, not Marxist <laughs> philosophy classes, um, as a result of that. Because that was something that the communists could go along with. I mean, they didn't have to... Um, continue something they came up with in the, in the f 1950s, right? Because that was completely obsolete. Nobody, uh, they, they could not uh, command um, the souls of, of the people by teaching them Marxist philosophy. That had, in the meantime, become clear to them. Uh, so this was just a, a, a heritage mm -hmm. which they gave away readily. But um, when, I, when I looked at, the, uh, at my colleagues who... Uh, who were s overnight uh, made politicians and uh, uh, crowd leaders, I sort of thought, uh, no, this is nothing for me. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to manipulate anybody. While, uh, on the other hand, it was clear that without manipulation they wouldn't get far. <laughs> That's strange. Mm. Um, there was uh, there was a, a, a popular spontaneous movement uh, fighting for truth and transparency uh, which was steered by people who were part of that movement who at the same time did many things against truth and transparency. Mm -hmm. um, I understood it was part of the game uh, that uh, politics can't be made any other way because if you speak the truth, if you're completely transparent, um, you will not be able to actually achieve your goals because other people who will not play al along the same rules that you do uh, will be more effective than you. It sounds like you're talking about the USA <laughs> right now. <laughs> right I'm now. talking about any b anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but but then that was that was some you know um, 
a lesson like in a lab. It was a hands-on experience. Um, you know, I, I was there doing some, I don't know, cleaning up logistics or whatever, and just listening to them talking. And I thought, no, 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 uh, I can't join that. I can't be part of that. I can be there. I can wait to be arrested or, uh, I don't know, risk my life. That's okay, but I won't be part of that. <laughs> what do you think of that, Stefan? Well, I think my life is boring. No. <laughs> Yeah, I did have an interesting life. It's true. I I didn't uh, sort of notice it at the time. <laughs> I had no time to yeah, notice. That's it. That's it. You, you, that's it. Well, and there's there's a lot to be said for youth. I yes, mean, absolutely, I, absolutely. I, youth like is I, the the time when you do these things. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. I look at all this, the insanity that's going on here in the USA right now. It's just nuts. All this lawless behavior and and the condonement of it by not speaking against it because mm -hmm. as soon as you speak against it you're a racist mm -hmm. and i i then um you think about uh, world war one and world war two and um vietnam and um and the things that you're talking about rafael i mean i'm thinking well um here we go <laughs> it, 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 it's when people talk about the good old days you know <laughs> In the good old days. What do you mean? Before there was penicillin? When was that? When was yeah. that? <laughs> exactly what? Well, in the States, I can tell you when it was. It's called the mid-century moment. Mm. And it was right after World War II. It I was think it was the, also in Europe. In the, yeah. It was the yes. 50s. Every, the yes. world was at peace. Mm -hmm. and, everybody, and everybody th thought that from now on, we can only go towards a better life. That's towards right. a better world. Yeah. Nothing bad can happen because what... What could be bad already has happened, and now we can just steer clear of that and sail to into the sunset, right? <laughs> so, what what's the answer? What's the answer? Yeah, <laughs> you need somebody else. Uh, <laughs> invite somebody else who will tell you no, what the no, answer is. No, I have no the idea. Answer, the answer is is here. The answer is. You've got to be, for me, I, I've been saying this now about myself, uh, and I think people take it humorously, but I actually mean it. I'm just trying to be the best Jerry I yeah. can be. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, when I hear, uh, and I hear again or have reviewed what you've done, Raphael, that, that, uh, it's, that's not a low statement. That was incredibly courageous for you. And how many children do you have, you and your wife? Uh, the one, one kid. Well, you had to make this decision that in your wife's a physician as well no yes mm -hmm. yeah she was worried about me leaving the profession yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean that's really i think about the the f she was worried about it but she supported that decision is that a fair uh, statement yeah well we you know we, we had an honest talk about it and i said uh, i feel pretty sure about this this being a safe bet uh, i can do this uh, what's going to happen is not going to be any worse and i think it's going to be much better mm -hmm. and i think uh, it can't be said that i kept my promise because things work out as they do yeah. i did my best for it to work out and it did but not only because i tried but also because the circumstances were such and i think i mm, uh, sort of assessed them uh well i i i i saw them for what they were right i i, I would say that uh, so the opportunities were that the telephone didn't start ringing immediately but i knew that would be the case uh, it just took the took some nerve to uh, to wait long enough uh, for it to start ringing yeah mm -hmm. um right it's it kind of rings in my head that you can't be afraid to take a chance yeah <laughs> i mean uh in in our own way i mean i'm not trying to compare you or Stefan or certainly not me to Lech Luenza or all of these things that uh, that you were part of. I mean, you know, I'm like a fly on the wall. I mean, so is Stefan. We're hearing you. It's remarkable because you're not telling us about someone this happened to. You no. you were there when it happened. So, it yes, I was there when it happened, although I had uh, no uh, no real uh, causative effect on it, uh, n nothing like it. I was just one of the very many people who witnessed it, who sometimes did something 
um, that uh, felt right to do at the moment and it turned out to be the right thing uh, in the long run. Uh, so uh, I certainly don't feel a hero and I wasn't uh, you know, an underground oppositionist or, or something like that. Many people were and they did risk stuff and they were arrested many times. Some were killed um, in a mean and clandestine way. Uh, so that the um, you know so, so, so the secret police could never be held responsible, uh, even though everybody knew it was the secret police, um, but the evidence was so mangled that no nobody could be actually you know selected as the culprit. Mm -hmm. Identified. I have, uh, yeah. On my side, I have one. Stefan, did you have some? No, I thought, well, what I was thinking is that, you know, the, the, that episode, this conversation was really serious and I wanted to end this <laughs> podcast on a more humorous note. And I just, I'm just curious about, you know, as uh, in your work as an interpreter, mm -hmm. um, what, what were the most funny moments? And I'm sure there was a lot of funny moments oh the funniest moments were the ones when i really bungled what i had to say <laughs> uh and uh, those those are things that um your uh, booth partner will remember forever uh, and if i ever forget they will remind me <laughs> because because it's funny um i I remember when we were doing um, uh, CNN live transmissions uh, of uh, the Iraq war in, uh, what was it, 2003? Uh, George W. Bush, Bush, Ju Bush Jr. Uh, was, was the person who uh, decided on, on that move. And... Uh, when it started, it was uh, possibly the first war that was staged uh, like a reality show with cameras everywhere. And um, uh, almost, um, it felt almost as if the TV um, production personnel uh, had a screenplay of what the army is going to do. <laughs> they were always there. They were always there, ready to take the shots. Um, the, um, mm, the reporters uh, had very insightful comments, uh, standing microphone in hand uh, on a wasteland somewhere in the background there was something burning or something uh, destroyed um, talking about uh, this stage of the activity uh, so um, yeah and those were times uh, th that was also the time of SARS 2003 I think it was SARS 1 yeah SARS 1 yeah SARS 1 uh, wh where uh, up, mm, so what I had to do was, together with, with some colleagues, we had to get up uh, at 3 in the morning or 4 in the morning, something like that, uh, and uh, sit in, in the TV studios of a certain uh, TV station which had a contract of retransmitting CNN as it went, as the feed went, so, so it was all live. Um, and we interpreted that into Polish for the Polish viewers. Fortunately, as we always said, at this time, this is not prime time. Not many people are going to see <laughs> our <laughs> mishaps. <laughs> and there were quite a few, I can tell you, because it was difficult, it was fast. The people were either reading off teleprompters or they had learned it by heart and they were saying it at machine gun rate. Um, and sometimes your mind just felt like it was bogged down by a single word. You just couldn't go forward. Uh, this being 5 a.m., right, where you would normally sleep. <laughs> and I remember that um, 
there, there was a camera following two uh, medics uh, carrying a soldier who had been wounded and uh, uh, what was said was that uh, this man's uh, intestines had been ripped out of his belly and I translated this man's intestines have been ripped out of his stomach me a doctor saying that intestines can be ripped out of the stomach <laughs> <laughs> this is why this is why he, he stopped this is yes <laughs> yes i just couldn't go on <laughs> no way <laughs> and uh, th there was another uh, another uh, report there that re related to sars um they were looking for patient zero in hong kong it turned out to be a uh, a professor of epidemiology or infectious diseases from China, from mainland China, uh, who attended a conference in Hong Kong about a new emerging pathog pathogen, <laughs> which uh, which wasn't quite defined back then, and it turned out that he had SARS. He died of SARS. He also infected quite a few people and it was demonstrated that he had taken a trip in an elevator and it was even shown which buttons he pressed um, <laughs> and uh, the concepts of the concept of a fomite was discussed uh, meaning uh, uh, an object which can transmit um, infectious material that was deposited there by by a sick person uh, and what I said was that um, viruses uh, move along surfaces, uh, something like that, a, a completely preposterous idea, picture viruses marching along surfaces. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was also, you know, th things, things of that sort, maybe somebody would have to help me, especially my yeah. booth partners who heard me. Um, orthodontics is actually uh, a treasure trove of, uh, you know, Mixing up a canine with a molar is nothing. I mean, we're not talking about these things. We're, we're talking about inventing new words uh, completely inadvertently, uh, unconsciously, um, where you, you already think of uprighting molars and you come up with a word which uh, is part molar, part upright. Uh, it's uh, like... Um, a newly described anatomical feature uh, <laughs> of the oral cavity. <laughs> right. We could, we could we could have uh, some sort of pamphlet, uh, Ragovsky's uh, dental terminology. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> the uh -huh. boo boos. <laughs> yeah. Well, I uh, as as uh, you and I have discussed, Raphael. Uh, right now, I'm meant to be back in Warsaw. Mm hmm next year and um one of the reasons i look forward to it immensely is you <laughs> i look forward immensely to meeting you in warsaw not uh, across a screen uh, well there is no shortage of remarkable astonishing uh memory forging conversations with you mm -hmm. every time every mm -hmm. single time yeah i enjoy i enjoy that yeah. So I can't wait till we have another one. <laughs> Thank you. I can't Good wait to be you. there again. <laughs> and have a nice uh, dinner, Jerry. Mm -hmm. At this, yeah, because that's another thing. The food. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh yeah. My, so. The restaurant is called oh. the, Soul, the Soul Kitchen. Oh. Mm -hmm. In Warsaw. That was the best, the best beef tartar I ever had in my life. Mm. Best duck I've ever yeah. had in my life. Unbelievable. Really, really? It, indescribably good. Yeah. It that was an experience great. being there. Well, uh, great. Let's have the restaurants yes. functioning again. <laughs> Let's do that as, as soon as we can travel mm. normally. Raphael, thank you for spending the time with us. Thank, thank you, you very much. much for having me. Thank it you very much. It was very uh, well. It was a history lesson today. Yeah. Well, Great. told by somebody who is anything but a historian. So I well. hope, I hope uh, this is not going to garner too much criticism about factography and stuff. <laughs>
I think wow. sometimes it makes it more interesting. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Regards to your Bye -bye. family. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. Do itzenya itzinguye, which is my poor attempt to say thank you and goodbye in Polish. Now join us next time as we meet with a dentist from Baton Rouge, Dr. Rob De La Rosa, who can teach us a lot about the business of dentistry. My name is Stefan Reinhardt, Director of Education for the Clear Institute, where dentists make the move.